Hi and welcome to another narration presented by yours truly, Cryptids Roost. Be sure to check out the blooper reel at the end of the video, which is then followed by the end screen, where you will find more videos listed. So grab your coffee, sit back and enjoy the show. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. I'm a pathologist who performs autopsies on nightmares. Part 1. This autopsy talked back. This awesome series is written by TJ Lee. Be sure to check out his new book, Beneath the Static. It is available in both Kindle and paperback versions. The Amazon link to the book will be listed below in the description. Death is a taboo topic for so many of us, something we shy away from, beat it over the head with a stick and scream at it to go sit in the corner until we are ready to deal with it. It permeates every aspect of our daily lives without us so often even registering it, yet we still run from it. Because despite our various faiths, practices and beliefs, we don't truly know what is beyond this existence. And that's terrifying for so many. Not for me though. For me, it's just work. Over here at Death May Die, we have a system that has remained unchanged for all the years I've worked here. It's one I will apply to every entry in my strange life that I share with you. Every three days, a new body winds up at my morgue with its own story about how it got there. Every three days, I'll report back to you with what I find. Some corpses are contorted, misshapen from the decomposition, rotted or burning. Yes still burning when I finally dumped them on the cold table. Ritual deaths are tricky and require big rubbery gloves. Mine have a few fun stickers from the local music scene, gotta represent, but they all have one thing in common. Every single one of them is a product of nightmares, literally and figuratively. Now. I'll say here for those of you already rolling your eyes so hard, they're already prepping to become billiard balls. I'm not expecting you to start up petitions for nightmare integration, or to start on your own creature feature dating sim. It is not my job to convince you. Sturgeon is a weird fucking place. I'll lay it all out for you. Sturgeon has a serious nightmare problem on its hands. We all know they walk where we dare not tread, and the folks like it that way, unless you've been sentenced for crimes that shall go unmentioned, or it's near the end of their life, you are never likely to meet any of their various ilk. A barrier separates Sturgeon's denizens, or daywalkers, for those who inhabit the darkest corners of our fears, and those who come along before we stepped out of our caves. Cryptids, nightmares, beasts and so forth. They have their own histories, legends, infirmities, fears and flaws. Most importantly, they all die. That means someone must tend to them, set their bodies right and perform whatever practice they held dear to them. Being the only mortician that is willing to cater to their final rites, it falls to yours truly. Fala McNamara, to do what needs to be done, and provide them with their last rites, maybe learning something about them along the way. With the latest iteration in the Tournament of Nightmares now over, my business has been busy to say the least. Bodies coming in covered in cuts, limbs totally eviscerated, and organs simply gone. They love to keep a girl busy, that's for sure. But that's not why we are here today. 
We're here today because of the nightmare of the forests that was hauled in last week and what was inside of him. I always hated early morning calls. Let it be known that Dr. Fala McNamara is not a fucking morning person. Not in a cute, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee type of way either. Miss me with that bullshit. I enjoy the quietness of night where the sun cannot expose my exhausted face and dishevelled frame like the judgmental bitch he is. Makes me love the winter all the more. As my bones rattled in the early morning chill, my mind wandered to a familiar question. Was med school really worth it? To become Sturgeon's sole nightmare pathologist and mortician? Looks borderline comical on a resume. Well, not like I could quit now. Hobbling downstairs from my apartment, Carly hands me a glass of something with a cheery grin and nervous hands. Morning Chief. Sorry to get you up so early. Our next client wasn't scheduled until after dinner. But you know how it is. I hope you're not mad. They fumbled with their hands and flinched as I took a sip before nodding at nothing and rushing to clean the reception counter. Carly was sweet, more nervous than a shelter animal meeting a foster owner, and easily the most alive thing in this entire building. They were good at their job though, and always thinking of new ways to bring efficiency to the business, so I would always tread lightly when they had a nervous spell. You know, you don't need to call me chief. Morgs just have morticians. Don't worry about the early start. I'll nap after. The hell did you give me though? I feel the kick in the back of my throat and my eyes widen. My feet feel lighter. Carly shouts back as they go to answer the door. Mellified man. Bender told me it'll wake anyone up pretty damn quick. Enjoy it, chief. I was halfway through a mixture of confusion and anger when the door opened and a burly man towering over us both sauntered in. A friendly smile over his face as a cold snap hit me and I rushed for the nearest coat or blanket. Hey hey, Carly you little scoundrel. Thanks so much for opening up. Wouldn't have called if we couldn't have waited, but uh he turned his head back outside and waved for his subordinates to wheel in the body. This one was special. Figured you'd appreciate it when you saw. The man standing in my funeral home was Detective Chino de la Sturgeon, head of the LNM Nightmare Detectives establishment that handled relations and issues between the two groups. Cavalier, fiercely loyal, and at times tactless. He was a reliable colleague and the sort of guy you could rely on in a pinch, even if… Oh God, Gino, what is that under your fingernails? Carly recoiled as he went in for a hug before looking down at his hands, amusement written across his face. This? Oh, it's just corpse pieces, stiff Got a little, uh, mulchy when moving him. But you're not going to let that stop a refreshing morning hug, are you? He grinned and let out a bellow as Carly <laughs> jumped over the counter to spray themselves down, repeatedly muttering, Nope! under their breath. If you're done terrifying my staff, shall we get down to business? I've suddenly found my morning zest and I want to get this started before I find myself passing out with a hacksaw in my hands. I don't need another Christmas party incident. I walk down with my arms still draping a nearby blanket around me like a makeshift cape. Hardly professional. But Chino was a friend. He nodded and shook my hand as we escorted the body to the main room. The building was built in such a way that accommodated both the funeral and more grisly research aspects. 
The greeting room Carly handled were small and dignified on the street levels. Portraits of animals in admiralty uniforms and nightmare creatures or cryptids looking peacefully in their caskets or atop funeral pyres were also commonplace and brought a sense of peace to those with families that sought us out. I'm not going to go cliché and postulate the notion that what if humans are the monsters? Because that would imply absolutism and to be frank, it's fucking stupid. But if it exists, it has kin and those kin need closure. I provide that first in the reception area and the bulk of my preparation in the chamber that is situated behind and below. It is an area the size of a small warehouse, fitted with lockers of all shapes and sizes for all manner of creatures. A workstation with a speaker attached for both music and communications from the front desk. A slew of my own personal oddities in jars, antique collections for both enjoyment and ritualistic purposes. A small alcove in the corner was dedicated specifically to what I called the meeting room. It housed my taxidermy animals from my earlier medical days and my council of spiders, a dear friend had gifted to me some time ago. The council were superb soundboards for particular queries, concerns or general advice I needed. Two dozen spiders ranging from the polarizing Madame Rumble, a phonopelma shelled coats, to the almost comical Duke Strasbourg, Theraposa Blondi, and last but not least, my near constant companion, jumping spider, Phidippus Ordex, Minerva, with her blue stripe and iridescent abdomen, piercing eyes and constant desire to nest in my hair. They all provide excellent advice in exchange for good feeds and decent space. It was my own personal safe haven from the world above, where the main companions I kept were either solitary like me or unable to respond at all. Immediately I felt the safety blanket envelop me and I got to work, observing the basics of our new resident. The body was 7 foot 9 inches and weighed 272 pounds. An XL tray accommodated him decently and the smell of burnt wood and moss filled my nostrils. As soon as Chino unzipped the bag and the deer skull popped out, antlers mid-shed and the right stalk snapped in half, I knew what I was looking at. Folks called them many things, Lords of the Woods, Forest Devil, the Woodsman and even Master Protector. But whether he was revered or vilified, he was respected under one unifying name across the western world, Leshy. I gathered the tools and studied my grimoire for the area depicting forest beings, their anatomies and their burial practices. Mr. Woodenhooser's Guide to the Methodically Dead and Magically Charmed, a one-stop guide for every ritual and anatomical blunder. I found the damn thing in a yard sale when I was six. It never steered me wrong before, even if the name was a fucking eyesore. Flicking through the thick and yellowing pages, I found a section on woodland beasts and how to both conjure them and bury them. This was going to be rough. Since he was found with no next of kin available, it fell to me to send the body off after I was finished finding out what happened to him. Joys of being both coroner and mortician, hoping nobody came to claim him in case we fucked it up. While I rummaged for the right tools, Chino told me what happened. It was nine minutes past six in the morning when we found him. His body was hanging by the ankles from opposite sides of a tall gate bordering on the Williams estate. Shit was nasty. I think some passers-by spotted him, but they damn sure didn't say anything. He shook his head and sighed. <sighs> Running his hand across his five o'clock shadow, 
and an incessant scratching noise echoing around my sanctum that set my own hairs on end. Gino, we talked about the noises, remember? We had a whole discussion about how they made me feel. I felt my teeth grinding as he put his hands up and walked back. I don't recall a talk, just you screaming to get out with a scalpel to hand. He smirked wryly. You mentioned something about castration and I promptly left. Then you know not to make the mistake again, don't you? Was there anything else or can I unwrap my present before this mellified man turns me inside out? I wheeled myself over to the table and began unwrapping the lesion from his plastic bag, laying out the tools I'd need for the procedure. Nah, uh, nothing else. I'll go grab a coffee with Carly. But, uh, Fala, do you ever think about your future? I looked up and he was leaning against the door, arms folded and a concern on his face, like a big brother or a father figure, ready to give the lecture of a lifetime. I mean, you know, beyond this place. Get hotter, get older, learn more, die. Feed the ground, become particles and travel unconsciously. All pretty standard to me. Why? I thumbed the pages of my book and looked at where I'd need to start. Most likely the chest cavity. Figures. But should I crack the ribs first or cut it open and see what happens? Don't you want a family? Maybe someone to do this with you? Someone to come home to? His voice dropped an octave. I worry about you here. Five years I've worked with you and never seen you with anyone. Well, not since... He let the moment hang in the air like some mistletoe I was expected to saunter under. But I gestured around me without looking up. There's over 200 bodies in here, each of them with their own stories, loves, fears hates and passions unfulfilled. I'm with them every day. They're just as much my friends as you are. I shook my head and gave him a blank expression, hoping the message would sink in. Everything else is just white noise. I like it that way. From the council in the corner, I could hear murmurings of agreement and phrases such as Solitary hunters are kin too and you truly will be on your own if my mealworm is late, child. I chuckled <laughs> and when Chino met my gaze, he shuddered. All right, all right. When you start talking to the council, I get unsettled. So that's my cue to bounce. I'll be upstairs. So just call me when you have anything. I believe in you, chief. I couldn't even retort before he chuckled and headed back up to the reception. The thick steel door slowed to close and Chino's voice booming out with a triumphant Hey Carly, wanna see what partial spontaneous combustion looks like? Little devils really have no control, so the first thing to sizzle is their While Carly screamed their goddamn lungs out in protest. It was like having two grown-up, hairy children. Never mind. Distractions are removed. Time for work. I put my dictaphone on play and left it on the side table as I slipped on my apron and began walking around the body. Patient number 621B, Leshy, male. Middle to late aged, most likely in the late 500s. The thick black chains of the joints were seared in his green moss covered flesh. The branches and foliage that adorned his body had been pruned, ripped out or cauterized. Not a single leaf was spared. Every edge was filled in plastic. Over his head was a thick bag with a hose attached to a car exhaust. Still running when discovered by passers-by. A black substance oozing from the sides of his mouth, ears and eyes. Cause of death? 
Look, I don't think I need to tell you that you can't suffocate a plant, but you can certainly put it to sleep with enough deprivation. Some sick bastard decided to let the poison do its work while our leshy was in a barely conscious state and unable to fight back. Leshies come in all shapes and sizes. Some are able to adopt the visage of tall humans when they are still powerful, but many lose their abilities as they get older. Instead looking similar to towering trees with oak limbs, a broad face with thick antlers forming a small crown. Regardless, they are revered all around the world as defenders of the forests, sometimes even violently if they feel they or their kin are threatened. I once dealt with a scorched female leshy who had tried one too many times to reason with deforestation workers in a small Slavic town. They thought her a demonic entity and cleansed her with fire. Her son looked upon me with bright amber eyes and told me every tree would know of what she had done. This particular one was still in his armour when he died, the deer skull still affixed over his head, defensive abrasions across his forearms and legs, clearly trying to defend himself against something but ill-equipped to do so. Nothing more for it. I suppose. I picked up the scalpel to make the Y incision. For those of you morbidly inclined, it starts on the shoulder, running to the lower end of the sternum and then downwards in a straight line over the abdomen to the pubis. Cutting through with some degree of effort, noxious fumes rising up out of the cavity, I set the scalpel down and gripped both sides of the incision on the shoulder and pulled. When I let go and looked down, I had to stifle a scream as I backed away to the safety of my meeting corner, the council of spiders all crawling out of their burrows to either console me or get a better look. Is it food? We would appreciate food, very much so, yes. Is it the chairwoman? Well. We do not wish to lose our primary feeder. My chest tightened and my legs shook. I was used to all manners of oddities when dealing with these kinds of creatures. But to imply I was desensitized to the unusual would betray the human elements I still harbor within me. Taking small tentative steps back to the operating table, I pulled the movable desk around and craned the light down over the section where his organs should be. Strange, green and filled of fauna they would be, yes, but the grimoire was never wrong. Instead I was staring down at a sprawling, densely packed city running from pubis to clavicle. The spires on top of houses and municipal buildings jutting up just beneath the last layer of skin the leshy had. Their black brick design reminiscent of Victorian era housing, but with an immediately far more uncomfortable atmosphere surrounding them. I peered down and saw small creatures cavorting in long flowing robes, their faces hidden and only small spindly appendages coming out where hands should be. Some spoke openly on the streets. Others were ferrying large carts of food, pieces of the leshy's organs, from one place to another. I saw small picnic tables where these things gleefully tore pieces off of the leshy's flesh, spewing a vicious black liquid around their dwelling and pasting it to the walls. Whatever the black liquid touched, the internal walls would start to grow a vile mold that sizzled as it spread. In the centre of this strange macabre town lay a pedestal atop a series of brilliant marble steps. A pair of statues depicting two figures in black robes and painted skulls for heads gripped a pair of obsidian shovels with pride, standing on either side of a pyre that connected to a thick black pipe. A larger cloaked individual stood in front of a crowd, 
speaking impassionately in a language I couldn't understand. But his hand signals and accompanying imagery certainly explained his agenda. Sacrifice. I could do nothing but watch as a small, screeching individual was brought forcibly by members of the crowd. Now chanting eagerly as the poor soul was thrown at the preacher's feet. Struggling to get up and staring around for help from someone, anyone, but nobody came to their aid. They simply pointed to the pyre. The dark flame was lit and I swear my own operating lights flickered. I was enraptured in the worst of ways as they shoved this person onto the fire and sang a chorus. The hood fell down and I felt my eyes widen in an even greater fear, that of inaction. It was the little girl, by all accounts human, and with only small deformities that were transfiguring her hands into the same spindly limbs her contemporaries had. She begged for clemency, for help. In any language, that's universal. Eventually her resistances ceased and the body fell limp over the pyre before being pulled into the black pipe. A guttural whooshing sound filled the body as it travelled up through the city and past the throat of the leshy. I was at a loss for words. No amount of medical training or living in this town prepared me for this. I furtively glanced down at the grimoire and hoped for some information. Unfortunately, little sentient towns living inside woodland beasts were not among their vast swaths of knowledge. God damn it. In a flash, the bulb on my light fixture burst and shards of glass rained down on my head plunging me into an imposing darkness. I cursed, but remained thankful I had a surgical cap covering my black hair. A light erupted from the body, a horrific and forbidden colour that I was never meant to see, that no person should ever gaze upon. Minerva, my jumping spider, crawled out of my chest pocket to perch herself on the top and stared intently at the sickening hue, her little pedipalps shaking. Casting my eyes up and away from the glow, I saw something that days on is still haunting me. The leshy was awake. His eyes glowed a strong amber, and the jaw encased inside his deer skull grew slack, as if accommodating a great weight trying to pry itself free from his gullet. Then he spoke, a booming voice that bounced around the walls of my building, growing in ferocity and power as the observation windows above threatened to shatter and my ears rang, my skull splitting. I see a place housing the dead, a realm where the barrier is broken down and all that remains is flesh and unresolved business. His head jerked and snapped the deer skull following me as I moved, desperately trying to get out of his purview. I see shadowy figures taking this vessel and putting it to work for their greater purpose. I see. I see. The voice grew discordant, manic even as the body regained life and it too began to jerk and thrash. I see sturgeon bathed in twilight. The unliving standing tall on the bodies of the greeter and the keeper. The dead will come to greet the living and all secrets will go to the grave. I see all things unravel, an endless spiral of decay and death. Fractals upon fractals. Something began to manifest in the back of the room arms gripping either side of the near 100 foot wide span and propping itself up as it took shape. A blackened, featureless representation of the corpse lying in front of me, still bleating out unhallowed prophetic drivel as my nose started to bleed. The orders will clash and brothers will spill their blood in the place with no name. 
the devourer of sins will be brought to her knees, and there will be no more spaces in between. All will converge unto the light of the dust walkers, before falling silent. My vision was swirling, and this shape started crawling towards me. Featureless, save for a hungry, gaping more of a mouth, locked in a static expression of apathy that set me more on edge than any wide smile or angry grimace ever could. I backed up into my corner with the council, but there was no room left to manoeuvre. I didn't even notice Chino bringing down an axe on the throat of the corpse, severing the head from the body in one swift motion. The splitting of wood and the screeching of so many living things at once put me in the fetal position as it ripped through the room. After a few seconds, I looked up and saw Chino covered in sweat and staring at the spot where he'd made the strike. Mustering up what little courage I had, I got to shaky legs and walked over, Minerva cowering in my pocket. The spectre from the back was gone. A thick cloud of ash hung in the air where it had reached out, some ten feet away from grabbing me. The leshy's eyes still shimmered and the deer skull started cracking, the twitching less pronounced. Eyes shifted from Chino to me before fixating on a spot above us and dispouting one final proclamation. In time, all the stars will go out, one by one, and we will remember. With that, the light faded and a thick pungent smoke left his mouth, making me gag at the first whiff. Adjusting my mask and exchanging a look with Chino, I stared back down at the city of creatures in the chest cavity. Every single one of them was staring at us. Red eyes like fireballs glistened behind dark hoods. Smaller children hid behind their parents and frail members shook with fear, but the rest simply looked at us as a threat. A single voice rang out from the town hall. A small shovel in his hand that he brandished with authority and they turned their backs to us, some shutting themselves in their homes while others huddled together. The two statues glowed bright as black smoke running through the town and enveloping the entire town until nothing but the spires were visible. When the smoke cleared, only the cloaks remained. Every single one of them had vanished and now only the empty city remains. I'm guessing this is not what you were usually finding a forest lord, huh? Chino remarked, breathing heavily and letting the axe drop with a thud, wiping his brow. Any ideas? I didn't immediately reply, the fear of my own mortality still sending shockwaves through me. Though I am for the most part at peace with my calling and the idea of death, there's something to be said for not going out on your own terms and the terrifying idea of being here one moment and gone the next. I just about avoided making a fool of myself and passing out by clutching the edges of the steel table and letting my breathing slow. No, no, that's not normal for a fucking forest lord, Chino. Flowers, moss, bugs, even small pure water deposits where the bladder should be, those are normal. An entire city of little people, complete with still alive corpse, yeah, fuck that, fuck that right in the ear, Jesus Christ. I pinched my nose and took a breath, thankful the man in front of me understood my hot blooded nature and lack of social decorum. I need to finish the job, hand me the circular saw, would you? He blinked in surprise before obliging and taking a step back. You're not even going to take a break? Seriously? Nobody would blame you, you know? He frowned as I grabbed it with shaking hands, gripping the handle tightly to steal my nerves, taking my mind back to the lessons I'd learned over the years and finding my footing 
once again. I would not let this beat me. I'm here. I'm alive. I'm well enough to continue. Plus, for his burial ritual, we need to be done by first light in some 90 minutes. So less chattering, a more skull scattering. The deer mass now crumpled away, and the frightened, but definitively dead face of the leshy staring blankly up at us. His hazel eyes, humanoid mouth, and the thick nostrils caked in the black substance that had spewed from the town in his chest. Some kind of poison? I scooped a portion up from the saliva, ocular, nasal, and what remained of the bladder to put into a vial for toxicology testing. Whoever did this had wanted him unconscious with the plastic wrapping and ensured maximum suffering upon waking up. Poor bastard. First making a triangular incision on the top of the scalp, stretching from one ear to the other and ending at the crown. I used the saw to cut through the bone and protect the soft tissue, not wanting to cause any more of a mess than what already existed. When putting the circular saw down, however, I notice a brand on the back of the leshy's neck, just above the vertebrae, and still clearly visible in spite of the clean cut Gino had made. I scanned my grimoire fervently in the hours following this and came to find a match for what I saw. It was a circular sigil with three distinct rings. In the centre lay the earth, rings running out, and each circle means something new. The central circle represents death, next life, outermost birth. The skin peeled off the middle circle, making it abundantly clear that this was no ordinary murder. It was a message. Instead of finding a brain, however, I found something far more disturbing. Something that would ultimately set me on the path I would find myself on now. In the place of any kind of brain was a mass grave of the creatures in the Leshy's chest cavity. So many of them were malformed, frozen in agony and charred. Thousands of them spilling out onto the table and disintegrating the moment they came into contact with the steel. I marked the cause of death as poisoning and a homicide. Unable to remove any of the now ruined city from his body, we instead sewed him up and prepared for the ritual. Aleshi is tied to the forests they inhabited, and while they have physical forms with lifespans, they are more spiritual than we could ever imagine. Their births, lives and deaths are indicative of that. A new Leshi is born every five years on the 20th of March, the dawn of the spring solstice, and a Leshi must be buried before the winter solstice on the 21st of December, lest they spend months wandering and causing decay in their own dwellings. With only an hour to spare, we ferried his body to the edge of the sturgeon old forest and a hole in the ground hastily dug by Chino's subordinates. No embalming, no headstone, no chemicals, just the soil. When the sun touched his body, a soft flame started at his feet and worked its way over his body. As we piled the soil over him, flowers spouted out of the ground and within moments a covered the spot in its entirety with wildflowers, rhododendrons, and a single lily. Your son has been returned to you, a new guardian, to watch over your lands. Let him bask in your light and grow anew. From the soil, we return. Gino and I hung our heads as the light finished covering the gravestone and made sure not to look upon the source of the rustling in the trees, the crunching of leaves all the scuttling in the bushes. Our respect was necessary, not our eyes. After a couple of minutes, a soft breeze whisked through the air. We knew we were done. As we left, I could have sworn I saw a pair of thick spiked antlers jutting out from behind a tree line some distance away. Perhaps a family member watching from afar. 
perhaps this Leshy found his way home. During our walk back, it became clear there was going to be a lot of red tape and work to be done. I resolved to write up my report and work with Chino on anything he needed. Whatever this was, no matter how horrifying, I would send myself to an early grave with stress if I didn't see this through. He told me things would be fine. I could tell he was lying. As we got to the front desk and began our goodbyes, Carly burst out in a fluster, covering in the leftovers of our leshy from downstairs. I always felt guilty for making them do clean up, but it was just this or feeding the council and I don't think Carly is prepared for what they'd say to them just yet. Chief, you got a letter. I think, I think you may want to open it. They clasped it in their filthy shaking hands. I raised an eyebrow. You shaking because of the gunk? I know you're particular about the messes, but... I trailed off when I looked into their eyes, darting for a safe place to decompress. I shook my head. Go ahead. Go clean up and get a coffee. We've got this. Carly bowed and ran for the bathroom with such speed I didn't think was possible. Running my hands over the envelope, I felt the fine paper on my name embossed in perfect white cursive against the charcoal backdrop, as if it were calling to me. Inside the note was simple and to the point, written in a thick green liquid, the blood of the leshy making my own run cold as my eyes scanned the warning. More will come. Momento mori. A sigil scrolled beneath it, the exact same brand I'd seen on the Leshy's body, but with the flesh covering the patch that was missing from his corpse. Two shovels intersecting in front of a painted skull, a name etched under the sigil in golden writing. The Order of the Grave Diggers. And I hope you enjoy the following blooper reel. It's one I will happy. It's one I will apply to every as. <coughs> Miss me with that bullshit. I enjoy the quietness of night, where the sun cannot expose my exhausted face and dishevelled frame like the judgmental bitch. Looks borderline comical on a resume. I'm not going to be... Dear friend had gifted me. I gathered the tools and studied my grimoire and an attempt and an anap hoping nobody came. I put up my dictaphone on play. I put my dictaphone on play and left it on the left <laughs> fuck's sake instead looking similar <coughs> I see sturgeon bathed in twilight I see sturgeon bathed in twilight the unliving standing tall on the bodies of the greater. <coughs> Fucking throat. <coughs> My vision was swirling, and this shape. I didn't even notice Chino bringing down an axe on the throat of the corpse. Severing the head from the body in one swift motion. Mo 
Adjusting my mask and exchanging a look with Chino, I stared back down at the city of creatures in the chest cavity. And find my foot. And finding my. The deer mask now crumpled away, and the frightened bit of. Dim not wanting to cause any more of a mess than what had. And a leshy must be buried before the winter solstice. Hey family, please be so kind as to throw punch the like button and smack the ass of the subscription button as well. And remember to choke hold that notification bell and then select all. That way you'll receive all notifications each time I upload a new video. And by subscribing, you'll be the first to see all of our new spooky creepypasta stories. A very big thank you to TJ Lee for allowing me to narrate this awesome series. Make sure to check out their Reddit profile for more brilliant stories. And be sure to take a look at the playlist here for more of their stories that I may have already narrated. I would just like to say a very big thank you to all of the authors that I have worked with and all the ones that I will work with in the future. So thank you all, my brothers and sisters. And why not hashtag Cryptids Roost in your comments. A quick thank you to all of my Cryptids Roost community family too. We are now well on our journey to 1000 subscribers. So please spread the word and help us to grow and expand. And don't forget to share the videos too. If you would like to throw me a dollar or three, I'd be very much appreciative. I do have PayPal, paypal.me slash cryptidsroost. Alternatively, I have an account at buymeacoffee.com. You don't even need to register on either site to donate. You can also follow us at my Facebook group, Twitter and Instagram. I also have Ko-Fi, BitChute and Rumble. I have a subreddit if you have a story you would like me to narrate for you. All relevant links will be below. And don't forget to check out the end screen. See above. That will also list some more videos in my back catalogue. Take care everyone and I hope you all have a wonderful and peaceful night. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. <laughs>